Uh, I'm Eric Hayo, Penn State, uh, and I'll be moderating. Uh, so if, I mean, I assume you're being a well-heeled academic audience, uh, hyped up a little bit, though you are on iced tea, that you will be well-heeled enough not to require moderation. But if necessary, I will moderate with an iron fist. Uh, nonetheless, we begin. Um, this is a workshop on experimental humanities labs. Uh, that is to say, our three speakers are people who direct or run, organize, and otherwise uh, uh, engage in the activity of the experimental humanities in center and lab formats. Uh, they will be speaking in this order. Uh, James Evans, our first speaker, who is the founding director of the Knowledge Lab and the Com uh, Computational Social Science Program at the University of Chicago. His research focuses on the collective system of thinking and knowing, ranging from the distribution of attention and intuition, the origin of ideas and shared habits of reasoning, to processes of agreement and dispute, accumulation of certainty and doubt, and the texture of human understanding. So he uses machine learning, a variety of other processes to do that. Our second speaker will be Nicole Coleman, who is digital research architect for the Stanford University Libraries and research director for Humanities Plus Design and Research Lab at the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis. She works at the intersection of digital library and digital scholarship as a lead architect in the design and development of practical research surfaces, uh, services. And our final uh, speaker is a two-headed animal uh, with two names, uh, Jack Chen and Camilla Fojas. Jack and Camilla work together at the uh, information human informat I'm sorry at the humanities informatics lab here at the University of Virginia. Jack is associate professor of Chinese studies. His research and teaching focus on the literary and intellectual traditions of classical China, as well as on broader issues in literary and cultural theory. As for Camilla, she is associate professor of media studies and American studies here, and she leads the surveillance and infrastructure research group under the Humanities Informatics Lab's uh, aegis. Her research explores transnational Asian, Pacific, Latino, Latina, American cultural and media studies in a comparative imperial context. So those are our speakers. They will be speaking in that order. And then at the end of their talks, which will last about 15 minutes each, we will have conversation, discussion, questions, and the like. Um, as uh, you've been to conferences before, I assume you know how it goes. <laughs> and so please join me then in welcoming our first speaker, James Evans. I'm uh, setting a self-delimiting timer just uh, because uh, here we are. Um, we're at conferences. We've been at conferences before. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'll call algorithmic abduction. And if you just, uh, if you type robot abduction into uh, a Google search box, um, this, is, this is what you get, which is interesting because it just keeps going. Uh, it's the same robot. It's the same woman <laughs> turned the same way. Uh, accentuating that, I mean, even the robot, the care, anyway, uh, so um, uh, I run uh, the Knowledge Lab. It's a center where we're really focused on uh, understanding, representing, kind of doing a big data science studies, and then using that uh, to generate hypotheses, questions uh, that uh, could be uh, interesting, uh, to kind of a computationally knowledge, uh, enhanced knowledge uh, about knowledge. And uh, so we're really interested in this idea of how scholarship uh, as a collective thinks uh, as a system and then uh, how we might be able to creatively, playfully uh, perturb it in ways that could be useful to it and its, its purposes. Um, uh, I, uh, our group had a piece that, uh, in science on the science of science, uh, a kind of a recursive monster. And, uh, but uh, that being said, I would argue, and in fact a lot of what we do uh, is, is focus on um, science, uh, but really science as a humanity. And the argument that, that sciences really do behave in many ways as humanity. So Bert Mueller, for example, who runs, um, or is the science head for uh, one of the national labs, um, argued that in his arguments to uh, Congress to try to fund the, uh, the natural sciences and fund fundamental particle physics, the argument is not that uh, you know, we're solving problems which will uh, systematically solve your problems. Oh, okay, someone saw that I had a low battery. You guys are good. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Uh, when I'm feeling low, you can just, I've got a little kink up here. <laughs> if you can <laughs> work that out. Uh, so, uh, but, but the, the argument was that, uh, that nature s uh, creates harder problems than we can create. And so essentially, you know, funding the sciences is, is funding a set of problem sets. Uh, which will facilitate the kind of creative solution uh, uh, and creative creation or recreation of bodies that we couldn't uh, essentially train on our own. 
Uh, you know, this is, um, you know, all sciences are humanities. You know, the fact that, for example, in the 1980s, uh, more than 35% of the basic science budget in Japan was focused on uh, earthquake prediction. Uh, the problem was in the 1980s, there was no traction about earthquake prediction. It was, it was solving an existential problem by putting money uh, that had no function, in some sense, towards a problem, uh, which if it were solved, but it, there was no chance that it would be solved at that time, uh, would have a function. Um, or uh, this is um, some of our own work where we basically uh, analyze, and you know, one might think about medicine, for example, as a means ends thing. We've got bigger problems in the world, and then we invest in those problems and come out with solutions. The problem is that uh, it doesn't work that way. It's kind of like Seinfeld. You know, when the scientific system gets large enough, it creates its own problems. And that's what we see systematically over time, that there's no association between the increase, for example, in pain and suffering associated with a particular disease and the research attention that's go, that goes towards that disease over time, it almost perfectly predicts or is predicted by yesterday's uh, attention. And, and you can actually, if you, if you trace uh, scientific questions over time and predict what are the baskets of things that people will focus on, you can predict about 95, 90%, 6% of those baskets, of all those baskets, for example, in the biomedical sciences, just as a function of, of what was trending uh, last year. Um, so in this, uh, we're interested in a number of different kinds of questions. For example, how it is that fields emerge. Uh, in this case, uh, a recent analysis, why it's recent, it's going to be published this fall, is on how it is that ambiguity um, ends up um, shaping the way in which uh, fields, both uh, in scholarship, the humanities, the social sciences, and the sciences, end up stimulating uh, field activity. So it turns out that on average, we you know build a little measure, but it ends up validating the, how people it is that how people experience words is more or less ambiguous. Uh, more ambiguity ends up creating more crosstalk to the people that read your work, and effectively uh, creates the arguments that stimulate uh, fields. Uh, concise. Uh, you know, uh, finding uh, clear findings end up killing fields rather than uh, generating them. Uh, we're interested in how it is that uh, scholars search uh, for classes of problems, and it turns out that even though there's so many people doing so many things, um, they look left and they look right, and uh, they end up kind of clustering around enormous hubs that if you were to spread them out uh, over science, you would be able to answer uh, all the questions that were asked uh, in about a tenth of the time, right? So you, you basically, you know, you're creating these, these uh, enormous kind of cocktail parties of, of labs that, that end up focusing the same, on the same questions over and over again, and partly as a function of the fact that we only positive, uh, 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 publish positive and not negative findings, uh, people end up performing the same doomed experiments over and over again. Um, uh, it, we're also really interested in this notion of collective intelligence and how it is as collective shift uh, that um, scholarly and scientific outcomes shift systematically. So this is just, um, this is a, a kind of a, 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 I'm sorry, it's a painful slide, but just look at the very upper left uh, uh, little thing, it's just we're showing it happens over and over and over again, um, is that basically as team size increases in science and scholarship, uh, of every time, at, you know, at, at every place uh, that we could look at, so this is about 80 million teams over time, um, that they become uh, exponentially, they exponentially decrease in the likelihood that they will disrupt or surprise, right? So from kind of one person to 100 people, in some fields we're able to look up to 1,000 people because of the uh, relative size of those fields, and that actually amplifies, that's that green slide there in the middle, uh, with the impact level. So really impactful single scholars end up being the most disruptive, and really impactful enormous level fields are the least disruptive. I mean, think about the, the physics Nobel Prize this last fall, you know, 1,069 authors on the same paper uh, that are, you know, testing a 102-year-old hypothesis, and they calibrated the machine for 25 years uh, to the theoretical estimate, which is to say the only thing they could discover was the thing that they anticipated to discover, right? They couldn't discover anything else. By definition, that would be miscalibration of the machine. Uh, and, uh, but it turns out that it's not just people, it's not just collectives, it's also algorithms too. So, uh, so this is a recent study where we're looking at how it is uh, that uh, the degree of, of overlap between persons, uh, the overlap between persons and machines, and methods and the things that they read in the past ends up dramatically decreasing the likelihood, in this particular case, that drug gene interactions will be robust in the future. 
right? So it's not just about the individuals that are kind of overlapping, it's the, it's the machines. It's the fact that, you know, if, so basically if you have high overlap or high centrality among the people who are participating in these investigations, if you have high overlap of the machines or methods, um, then it's very unlikely that conditional on some slightly perturbed experiment in the future that the same finding is gonna come through. And the reason is because, of course, you're performing the same experiment over and over and over again, right? You're, you're sitting on some little fragile space uh, in this context. So, um, so I, I, I'm really interested when I say collective intelligence, I mean kind of human and machine collective intelligence. You know, how, how do we think about human and machine collective intelligence uh, in this context? So um, uh, I'm going to just kind of pull out a distinction that, uh, that I, you know, Lydia talked a little bit about some of the, the context uh, that pulled this together. So um, in the 1950s, there was a, a real difference between intelligence amplification, IA, and AI, right, artificial intelligence, right? So IT was uh, intended uh, in the introduction to cybernetics by William Ross Ashby uh, to amplify human intelligence, right? To act as another player in the context of some broad human machine team, which contrasts with this artificial intelligence pro project that's about building human-like intelligences as an autonomous technological system, as a computer, as a robot. Um, and so uh, this gave rise to this idea of the cyborg, right, which was a cybernetic organism. It came directly out of the cybernetic movement, an organism that's restored to function or enhanced or broadened into this broader network due to the integration of, of some artificial component of technology that relies on feedback. Now, this was what they thought of as the cyborg, right? This was the initial canonical, like it was the man in the spacesuit that was walking around. It was this particular extension. And the model, of course, uh, was the thermostat, right? That there would be feedback between these different components that would facilitate some uh, kind of uh, enhanced uh, super system. And that's, you know, these are some of the kinds of things that, that we spend time doing in Knowledge Lab is thinking about uh, these augmented collective intelligence systems. So for example, we're working on a project uh, where we've downloaded all of GitHub, this huge public repository uh, of, of data and running experiments to figure out what kinds of computer languages uh, end up making groups and individuals think in different kinds of ways, right? In terms not only of efficiency and collaborativity, but also in terms of creativity and surprise and mistakes, uh, et cetera. Um, we're also interested in kind of looking for things that uh, where it, it, it's very, likely impossible that humans would look for those classes of questions. Uh, and so it turns out, for example, um, we find that, uh, that science in and of itself, um, basically when we trace the prediction, so I, I mentioned earlier you can kind of predict next year's science, well, it turns out if you take the unpredictability, right, of next year's science, so the unpredictability of any particular paper that would show up in next year's canon or corpus, um, that ends up predicting almost 50% of the likelihood that it will be in the top 1% of citations, right? So the surprise itself is the thing that's, uh, that's partly driving uh, this, uh, this system. Uh, it turns out, however, that people are trying to hide the surprise uh, to build on the shoulders of their audiences. Uh, so if you actually look at the things which are surprising, and you look at the similarity of those things to the other things that showed up in that journal over time, that we basically cite the things which are familiar to our audiences almost 10 times as much as we cite the things that are unfamiliar to our audiences, right? To, 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 to appear uh, that we are, uh, you know, that we're revering essentially the, the editors and reviewers that we're I I invariably going to be reviewed by. Um, but we're using these kinds of things to kind of turn around and generate uh, in one particular context, uh, optimal therapeutic cocktails, right? That kind of are almost unimaginable that, that scientists would have thought of those before uh, because of the contexts that they sit in and because of the inertia that is so prevalent uh, in the sciences. And so we're interested in the kind of exploring this in the context of, of humanities scholarship as well. Um, one point that I'll make before, uh, before I get there, and I realize that we don't have very long to get time to get, to, to get anywhere, uh, is um, this, uh, this idea of, uh, you know, collective intelligence requires a kind of a breaking down of a canonical historical trope between human machines, uh, between, for example, uh, diverse crafts and the individual factory system, between the many traditions and a single kind of economic rationality, uh, between art versus algorithm. Uh, because there are, in some ways, many diverse algorithms 
uh, that are involved in any of the most successful ensembles in the same way that there are many diverse persons which are involved in the, uh, the most uh, successful assemblages. Um, and so uh, I'm just gonna skip that. But I, I, but I will say that the idea of artificial intelligence is the thing that has kind of dominated the kind of the popular trope of these algorithms and it defeats really the fundamental promise uh, and purpose of most of the, you know, of the most successful uh, algorithms that we have available to us. So for example, the notion of the Star Trek Borg, has anybody watched Star Trek? You guys are too smart and, okay, my God. Okay, um, is that it's this network thing, there's no diversity, and in the end, that's always how humans kick its butt, right? It's because it's like it drives out all diversity from the system, you know, the resi resistance is futile is kind of this like ironic phrase, you know, that kind of keeps coming up right before resistance becomes like the, you know, the, in, you know, the, the necessary end. And so I'll just throw up a couple of diverse examples of this space. So when we think about computing, we often think about Alan Turing, right? He formalizes the concepts of algorithm and computation within the context of the Turing machine. Um, really the father of one of the canonical articulations of artificial intelligence and the notion of the Turing test. Um, but um, it's really not Alan Turing, but, but players who have very different kind of intelligence, like Hans-Peter Loom, for example, that a historian colleague of mine has spent a lot of time uh, looking at, who uh, really grew up in the printing trade in Switzerland. Uh, becomes a textile inventor, joins IBM as a senior researcher in 1941, and he's the person, not a, a Turing, but a printing imagination, ends up you know, coming up with the idea of punch cards, hash codes, which have become so uh, contextually relevant today, keywords and context, right? So these human computer interactions, automated uh, indexing and selective uh, dissemination of information, right? So it's, it's really these very different kinds of intelligence that are mixing that become the basis of, um, of, of effective ensembles. Um, so, uh, and I won't spend more time on this, but, but the, the, you know, the history of chess is, is, is now, it's, it, you know, it's, it's over machine, you, we might think machines are always winning, uh, but it turns out in this play chess competition, this freestyle chess, in which you can have on each team an arbitrary number of computers and machines, um, it was a character, Zach S, uh, which was comprised of Stephen Crampton and Zachary Stevens, who were kind of crappy, New Hampshire chess players, uh, B and D class players, uh, with like four off the shelf, and I mean like off the Toys R Us shelf, uh, you know, uh, simulators on three, you know, kind of home Pentium machines that beat these grandmasters combined with huge, uh, you know, machines and Hydra, the chess specific supercomputer that, that was like a dumpster fire. Uh, and uh, so, you know, so all this to say, uh, well, and, and uh, if you were to look at modern machine learning, this so, this, I mean, these are, these are warring tribes. This is not, you know, one slick, uh, you know, algorithmic genius. It's like, there's very different intelligences, which, uh, you know, include everything from kind of similarity-based learning approaches, where, you know, you're trying to figure out, you know, classify something as a function of a space that you generate, uh, that it's close to in this, in this newly induced space, like this unicorn, um, versus Bayesian learning, where you're basically updating probabilities as a function of past experiences, but if you think just a moment, you realize that these are completely opposite approaches to thinking about this. If you have a novel instance, right, uh, Bayesian learning crashes and burns, right, because it extenuates uh, your kind of improbable, you've smoothed your improbability, so it's not zero, but it's almost zero, versus the similarity-based learning that basically slices something into the, the context of the present, totally different. Uh, or information-based learning, right, where you're basically asking an optimal sequence of 20 questions to kind of reduce the entropy of cases within any particular bin of your classifier, or connectionist learning, or evolutionary learning, or geometric and topological learning, or signal learning. Like, these are all warring tribes. They're not using the same un, uh, fundamental imaginary. They're thinking very different ways about how it is uh, to generate these things, and this is where these, these algorithms, these human and machine algorithms constantly win. So this is the, uh, the Netflix prize championship, uh, the $1 million prize that went to Belcour's Pragmatic Chaos, which was an assemblage of about 10 different teams. And what was interesting is that the first team was basically predicting the missing uh, uh, cells in the matrix of humans and their ratings of popular movies. And the third best team was the team that basically had, had uh, almost optimally predicted the likelihood that there was a new life event, that you basically had a kid who was watching Barney uh, on your Netflix account, and that's a different kid than you are, right? Or that you get a new girlfriend or a boyfriend, you know, that it's not the same person, right? And so when you put those together, 
is when you end up having this additive outsized uh, benefit, and, and this is effectively one that's competition, um, which I won't talk more about. Uh, but it, but the, you know, the, the bottom line, uh, until the singularity or the nerd apocalypse, uh, ensembles rule, human machine ensembles rule. And so in that context, the question becomes a question of, of robot pedagogy, right? So how do we become reflective of the roles that we want robots to play in the context of these assemblages? And one thing I'll argue is critical, but, but largely overlooked is this idea of the objective, right? Of the loss function, which becomes this critical part of all machine uh, learning and st statistical algorithms involving optimization, right? So. Uh, the idea is you know, that, that the objective is what it is that you want, and you train the machine to do what it is that you want, which is typically, in many applications, what it is that you've seen done before. Uh, it just turns out that that is, uh, oh, this is tingling. Uh, that means my time is up. But I will, I will, I will just uh, close to say, um, not close, close, but I'll almost close. Just give me another minute. I mean, I, I only give myself 15 here. So, um, so uh, you know, uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, one question, one uh, uh, concern that's been expressed uh, by Tim uh, Brennan and many others is this idea that you know, uh, machine learning and these counting approaches are not giving us what we want, right? Uh, they're giving us um, what we've trained, but not what we want. Uh, and I, I chat with a colleague at, at uh, Chicago, Bill Brown, you know, he asks, where are the new readings, right? Where, where's the surprise? in the reading. So like we have extended corpus level readings, we kind of expend beyond uh, the kind of our individual corpus to and beyond the canon, uh, but where are the new readings? And so um, I would argue that, that uh, you know, we, we've trained a generation of robots to, to produce really crappy readings, right? And, you know, if you think about Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics, you know, the, the robots have to do what the humans ask them to do, right? We're not creating dangerous children, we're not creating Caliban's or Frankenstein's, we're creating uh, really uh, overworked, underpaid graduate students. Uh, and so, um, so I, would, uh, I would encourage us to really think, and I'd love to, to talk with you over the next couple of days, to think about what are our objectives and subjectives? What is it that we want to create? What is it we want to avoid? I would propose the possibility, I live in, in the kind of science studies realm, and, and uh, Bruno Latour has this uh, articulation in lab life about anthropological th strangeness. Like, do we want the most human machines? Or do we want the most alien machines, right? The most provoking machines. Uh, the readings that we couldn't have imagined uh, on our own. Uh, you know, supervised methods, for example, will produce uh, readings like what we've seen before, even if they're amazing readings, you know? Uh, <laughs> even if we're reproducing geniuses of interpretation. Uh, it may not be what we want. We may want fundamentally <laughs> different kinds of creatures to, to propose things for us. We, want, we may really want aliens. Uh, and I'll just, uh, I, I'm really closing uh, out. Uh, so um, it, it, we can also turn to, to unsupervised methods, clustering, topic modeling, vector space, uh, you know, autoencoder embeddings, which are kind of the, like the new uh, thing under alternative geometries. The problem is, um, that they produce so much garbage uh, because, uh, you know, they, they produce many things that are, uh, you know, a few things that are interesting to us, many things which are obvious uh, or stupid. And so uh, I would argue for really thinking uh, about architecting these machines in a different way, right? Inversely supervising these kinds of things. So I was going to teach you about abduction, but let me just jump to the, the quick. The idea here uh, is uh, that, you know, abduction uh, notes that you have some surprising fact C, and if A were the case, C would be a matter, of course, hence there's a reason to subsect that, that A is true. So how can we interpersonally kind of create these moments of abduction? Uh, it requires putting the readings and interpretations, putting the theory into the bot, <laughs> right? And then calculating the surprise. I mean, it requires thinking uh, uh, differently about how it is that we, we construct these classes of things. This is uh, a colleague of mine who did this in the context of recipes. So he maximized uh, pleasantness, or, or he maintained pleasantness and familiarity of the recipes that he automatically generated and maximized surprise, right? So uh, the idea here is, you know, the scale divergence between the model without that. So he basically put in the theory. Right? He put in a whole bunch of known psychophysical associations between ingredients and olfactory experience and was able to produce, and I've tasted these, they're not bad, and they're definitely not toxic, right? So that's the, that's the, the, the hunch. So how to treat uh, 
a bad robot. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to go deeply into my little uh, effort to, to treat the bard in the context of 17th century uh, um, language. Uh, but uh, when you create these bots, you end up creating a kind of a cultural world, right, that captures how it is that people thought about a variety of things. It turns out, I just ran these this morning, monster minus man, this is in a vector space which is constructed out of um, thousands of 17th century dialogues, both human and, and inhuman. Monster minus man plus woman equals spider. Uh, love minus uh, woman plus man equals honor. Anger minus noble plus common equals transgression. I love these. You know, they capture in some ways a kind of a Shakespearean and a legal world. And so it turns out if we optimize for prediction, if we train these robots like graduate students, they produce the kinds of un problem play categorizations which are largely unproblematic. But if we optimize them for fitness, if we optimize them su for surprise, we find something else, right? Something that's provoking, something that is worthy of an interlocutor. Uh, and so I would just argue, you know, in robot manners, uh, you appear to understand, appreciate, and revere your masters, right? If, if we code our robots to do this, and this is what science does. Like I, can, uh, I can show you time and time again that this, you know, as a scientific system, you know, you know like we, we, we train, we beat into uh, the next generation uh, the, the need to kind of to reverence those uh, in the future. This is a PNAS piece where that came out uh, about a month and a half ago where we showed that, that basically people, we, we developed a measure of influence, just discursive influence, and we showed that, that uh, the, the greatest deviation from that influence are the people who had published in a field for a long time. Right, in a very subspecific field for a long time. So people, so their, in, their discursive influence can't get any higher, right? But it's like, it, but people's returns to, to arguing through their citations that those people were enormously influential uh, kept going up and up and up and up. So just the, the fi this is my final slide that uh, arguing that really, you know, you must, you know, we must predict established structures uh, for their provocations to be taken seriously in conversation, right? If we expect robots to be able to reproduce everything that we know, right, in a kind of, like at a remedial level, then they're gonna produce dumb uh, insights. They're unprovoking, unprovocable insights. We may, this may be asking too much of our students. It may be the wrong thing to ask of our robots. Uh, with that, I'll close, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicole Coleman. Thank you, James. That was fantastic, as always. Um, so I, um, my, with my title, I, I, I mentioned um, you know, data is a medium. And I, I'm going to use data in the singular. I hope that doesn't upset anyone in the room, but sorry. That <laughs> um, and other discoveries in the lab. I think I'm just gonna leave it because of the time constraints um, and kind of go into uh, this understanding of data as a medium that we arrived at. But, um, and I, I was particularly inspired um, and encouraged um, to hear Ashil last evening say that, you know, despite the kind of dire <coughs> nature of our situation where knowledge is, is being um, replaced by information, there is an opportunity for, um, for a kind of reformulation uh, if we can develop different modes of seeing and analyzing patterns. Because I think that's exactly what we've been trying to do in um, Humanities Plus Design Research Lab at Stanford. Um, and you know, we got to that is because what we did is we placed ourselves beside other labs, digital humanities labs going on at the same time, literary lab and the spatial history lab at Stanford. Um, and we recognize that you know, machines can, can perform tasks quickly on a really large scale, and those, that has an obvious benefit um, for research that uses statistical methods. But, um, and, and, and the literary lab is a great example of that. Um, the spatial history lab used GIS, so statistically based, statistically based visualization, um, but they sort of struggled with that, right? So um, the models that they used, um, were designed for digital cartography, and, and you know that grew out of this kind of excitement about mechanized map production. Um, and so the statistical thinking was baked into um, how that software operated, um, but it it was unsatisfactory to what Richard White, who was um, at initially um, the 
head of that lab wanted to actually accomplish, right? Because it didn't handle any of the softness um, and of, of boundaries and the change over time um, and that sort of thing. So then what they ended up doing within that lab um, was they would build visualizations to accompany research outputs that were kind of um, hybrid uh, outputs of GIS combined with a kind of customized flash, and, and, and later they used D3 um, to show you know, the map data in sequence and, and change over time and that sort of thing. Um, but you know, we, we were fortunate because you know, we didn't want to adopt to those tools. We didn't have to. We could start to think about what sort of tools we would de devise of our own. Um, so we, when we, we, we knew that we, didn't, we weren't really working with quantitative methods, we wanted to count but measurement wasn't the key. Um, we did use scale to see um, people and letters in a kind of larger context to help us determine what to read closely. But our end goal remained um, a detailed investigation of the primary sources. So like Spatial History Lab, we wanted to spatially and temporally visualize data in layers so we could provide more opportunities for geographic, um, chronological, historical comparison. But while Spatial History um, Lab projects use the strength of GIS to run spatial analysis on paths over terrain, shifting demographics um, in carefully defined areas. We just didn't have the data that was granular enough to provide that level of specificity. We were more interested in place as a cultural phenomenon and loose co-location as a sort of potential indicator of connection or influence. So our initial visualizations were projections of social networks on this sort of geospatial grid, and that did elucidate patterns of travel and the flow of ideas. Um, and it was only at the level of cities and, and reason, regions. We weren't concerned with you know, articulating political boundaries. Um, and you know, in part, that's just because we didn't have the measurements or the questions to fit the methods that those tools, those statistically-based tools, were designed to support. Um, so <coughs> we wanted to see historical information in a new context, sort of make new connections that weren't apparent from um, just from reading the sources, uh, which is the reason why we visualize. Um, but the challenge for us was, you know, how do we define then our relationship to data, right? Because the tension started immediately when we found ourselves trying to translate historical sources into actionable data. Um, it, what makes that process uncomfortable is like taking rich source material and then reducing it to something that's going to fit into discrete cells right, in a spreadsheet. Um, so what we ended up doing really um, is, is looking to, uh, in, you know, instead of looking to um, a kind of statistical method of modeling information, we decided that we wanted to build tools to help researchers model information, right, as opposed to running models on data. Um, but how might we actually model it? And it forced us to think about data really differently, to consider data as a medium. Um, so I'm going to just sort of jump into that idea. Um, my brother went to the hospital recently, and, and to explain how he was feeling, he said to me, he described it to me as, imagine you're in a desert with no food and no water. First day, you can crawl about a mile. The second day, a few yards. By the third day, you're lucky if you can move a few feet. Um, and he said when he f went to the hospital, he felt like he was on that third day in the desert. Um, he really didn't think he'd make it out of bed the next day. But during the intake in the hospital, the nurse asked him to describe his pain on a scale of 1 to 10. I'm sure that many of us have experienced that, right? Uh, 10 obviously being the greatest pain. And he said 2. So my brother's a builder. Um, for him, pain is like a nail through your hand or um, a two-ton beam crushing your foot or something like that. So what he was experiencing that morning in the hospital was not so much pain, right, as the fear that he might not be able to take another breath. Um, this whole concept of a number between 1 and 10 is, is, is commonly collected from patients as a measure of pain. Um, each one of us will answer it differently. Many factors influence our estimates. I had to answer that question myself recently on a return visit to the orthopedic doctor about my knee. I told the assistant it was a difficult question to answer because though I was in great pain at that, I was not in great pain at that moment. I know the condition is chronic and deteriorating with each passing day. So she told me that the number is a point of reference so they can determine from visit to visit if things are getting better or worse. <laughs> so my condition was worse, so I asked her what number I'd given last time. <laughs> and it was a five. <laughs> so with that as a point of reference, I said seven. Um, 
Did it feel two points worse? <laughs> you know, maybe. Um, it did the night before my appointment, right? So I said seven because I wanted treatment. Um, and yet I was not by any stretch concerned, like my brother, that I'd not be able to get out of bed the next day. Um, so these kinds of experiences make me worried about how we collect, interpret, and act on the basis of that kind of data. Um, anyone who's serious about making arguments with data knows that it's essential to understand where data come from, how they've been processed before performing, uh, before performing any analysis. Statisticians, data scientists, Journalists repeatedly make this point in, in critiques of bad data analysis. We design data collection procedures that take into account the messiness. We have methods and controls for data capture that allow us to manage certainty so that we can predict trends and measure probability. Statistics, also known as the science of uncertainty, has given us models for processing and visualizing data to make sense of it. Um, knowing your sources is an indication um, of, of rigorous method. So how do we analyze data that are not well documented? How do we make sense of data captured without consistent or even intentional method? Um, I suggest that we look to the humanities for this. So because if, if statistics is the science of uncertainty, we might think of the study of the past as um, the art of uncertainty. Humanistic inquiry assumes uncertainty, ambiguity, idiosyncrasy, and unpredictability. There are methods across the humanistic disciplines that help us find meaning and uncertainty. But it's only fairly recently that these methods have been wedded with data analysis in so many different fields of study. Without readily available computational tools for data gathering and data analysi analysis that are designed around humanistic method, statistical tools were and continue to be readily adopted. Uh, Johanna Drucker has drawn our attention to the, the problem um, that this presents when she insists that we use the term CAPTA or taken in the humanities instead of data. Um, which has its root in um, the verb to give. Um, I assume she still holds to that. Uh, she was influential in, in the very early days, you know, um, 10 years ago when we started this project. And um, her argument has drawn attention to the, to the act of data gathering and the influence that that action and our underlying choices have on the outcomes that we produce. Um, understanding and taking into account these influences is, is essential to the integrity and validity of knowledge production. If we take, for example, work on early modern correspondence, which is wh where, wh where the Humanities Plus Design Lab sort of began with Republic of Letters, um, we created data from extant historical records. There are layers and layers of influence that have shaped the selection of those records before we even had access to them. Um, and if they have been digitized by the time we get them, um, we're working at scale, off, uh, you know, often the data has been collected, cleaned, organized many times over before it even comes to us, right? Um, and so those layers of influence have not yet been documented. Gaps in the record, too, are, are very many and unpredictable. Um, 18th century correspondence doesn't come in convenient, complete packages. Um, questions, the, the question arises, at what point do we call it data when we're shaping it with additional categorizations and annotations based on expert opinion? How do we trace provenance and record the many layers of interpretation? Dan Rosenberg has written about the history of the concept of data and, and points out that we too easily confuse and conflate evidence, fact, and data. Rosenberg says that evidence is epistemological, fact is ontological, and data is rhetorical. And this idea really excites me because it opens up the possibility of keeping the concept of data while allowing for the many different ways that we use data across different domains. So uh, what I'm arguing is that when we decouple data from fact and even from evidence, we can begin to think of it as a material with which we express ideas and create stories. The validity of those expressions is based on context, the domain within which it is, is generated and presented. This at once, this frees us from the overly simplistic debate about whether our data analysis reveals the truth or not. And instead, it requires us to rigorously evaluate the analysis with respect to the ep epistemic goal of the analysis. So like graphite in the hands of an engineer drawing technical plans produces a really different result than graphite in the hands of an artist capturing a moment in time on paper or a journalist with a notepad um, and pencil. The medium is the same, but the intention is different. Within these familiar communities of practice, we would rarely confuse the medium graphite with the argument, and yet data is often confused with argument. 
Um, we still don't fully understand how to account for the properties of data or even how to understand it as a medium. We overlook the expressive qualities of data and how it responds to the instruments used to capture, manipulate, and display it. By thinking of data as a medium, we foreground its rhetorical plasticity and can let go of the false controversy about accuracy in data-driven drawings and research, instead applying the appropriate technique to achieve the desired result. So I'm suggesting data is a plastic, malleable medium, um, which we can use to construct hypotheses and build intuitions, express ideas, and create stories. When we acknowledge that data has this inherent expressive properties um, that can be exploited, to make an argument, we're compelled to critically evaluate not only the resulting argument, but the qualities of that data, the instruments used to shape it, and the intentions of the creator. Um, th this is uh, an acknowledgement that data is not inert or neutral, that its potential, um, when activated, it can be shaped to, to persuade. Um, and you know, there have been many critical responses to this notion that, that the data speak for themselves. Um, and yet, nonetheless, we too often allow our decisions to be driven by data divorced from context. Um, and this is where I feel like this point fits so closely into um, our uh, initiative um, within the library at Stanford, um, a artificial intelligence initiative, and also the campus-wide human-centered AI initiative. Um, because if we are to acknowledge the data that is behind the tools and the outcomes um, that can really significantly change um, how we approach those, uh, not as problems to be solved, um, but really as, as, as things to be explored and, and, and understood and, and directed to better understand ourselves, right? Um, as the data that is generated is ours, was made by us, and so um, as we process it, we start to, to better understand ourselves. Um, how are we doing on time? A couple minutes. Okay. Um, I might stop there because I, um, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for, um, for questions. Um, let me just say it here. I'm, so, well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I can, uh, d drag this, cut this down. Okay. So, um, I wanted to say something here about um, uh, this compulsion to um, uh, think about visualization as something that's um, you know that's objective, um, um, that, that's precise. So you know, our compulsion to, to equate uh, objectivity with science, truth, accuracy, and precision is similar to our propensity to equate data with truth, accuracy, and precision. And why does that matter? Because we continue to fall into this useless debate about aesthetics versus accuracy as if they were mutually exclusive. Um, and um, you know, there's this blurring of distinction that's happening already in the sciences, you know, be between science and art, um, with the intervention of um, uh, of engineering. Um, and you know, what we discovered in the process in our lab of trying to work with data, we struggled both with the designers we worked with collaboratively, and when I say worked with, we worked with designers. Um, who are design researchers, right? Not designers for hire um, to, to do our bidding, um, but people with whom we were not sharing a research agenda, but with whom we had a, a complementary research agenda. They had their own, we had ours, right? Um, and, and similarly with, um, with computer scientists that we work with. But the problem that we came up against um, is that they were trying to solve a problem for us, right? and we were trying to explain that we didn't have a problem that needed to be solved. <laughs> Uh, that wasn't the nature of you know, what we were trying to accomplish. So th it, that is, is also uh, this key point of um, the moment that we're in uh, as we come into contact with uh, artificial intelligence and the, the tremendous potential of this technology. Um, but because it's driven by an engineering mentality, it's so much about what problems can we solve. Um, and that tends to, therefore, you know, complete systems as opposed to um, tools that can augment us, right? Because it's really, really difficult um, to, it's much more difficult to augment humans than it is to just simply build a complete system um, and, and, and put that to market. Um, so the, the, the point for us um, <laughs> with this is that it was not only getting designers and the computer scientists to better understand why the specific data that we were working with, the, um, had its source in this material, and every detail of it was very, very important, right? We couldn't treat it just generally. 
Um, and it wasn't just about you know, shaping it to some given end. It was about discovering it. But it was also the struggle for us in the lab to articulate humanistic method. And I think that was sort of another key point. Coming into contact with technology forced us to articulate humanistic method, which helped us to bridge that gap and actually have a meaningful conversation. And that's the, the key um, connection to this notion of data as a medium, right? So on one extreme, we can think of um, data that's used uh, to, to produce, um, produce art. Uh, and that was one thing that we looked at quite a bit, not to replicate, of course, in any way, but just to get an alternative to the notion um, of data as something that is uh, meaningless in and of itself, but used to um, a particular end um, to, to fulfill uh, some you know, agenda of building a technology. So I will just leave it there. <laughs> All right, so our third pair of speakers, Jack Chen and Camilla Fojas, um, we're going to move immediately from their talk into, and after your applause, into the Q&A, and then we will end this session at 3.40 to give everyone a five-minute break before the next session begins immediately, and it must begin immediately at 3.45 because we need to finish in time for delicious dinner. <laughs> I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. Do you All really right. want us to, to <laughs> give us that latitude? We are... Okay, in any case, there's a five minute break and no more coming your way. For now, Jack and Camille. Thank you, thank you. Um, and so as Eric said, this is a two-headed beast, so I will be um, finishing one part of it and then I'll turn over to Camilla and then I'll come back. Um, so that's just to let you know what we're doing. Um, I'd like to thank um, uh, Deb Johnny, uh, um, uh, who you know, organized this event, but also as co-director of the Humanities Informatics Lab, of which um, I'm also co-director along with um, Alison Booth, uh, who couldn't be here today. Um, and, um, and beyond that, I want to thank Julie and Anne, uh, Julie um, Gronlin and Anne Gilliam, um, who've made a lot of this possible for us in the daily uh, operations of the Humanities Informatics Lab. And also, I'd like to thank Francesca Fiorani and Ian Bochum, um, Associate Dean and Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, um, because um, and as, uh, what I'm doing today is going to be somewhat descriptive. I'm going to be giving you an overview of how our lab sort of is um, structured, um, and then Camilla will give you some specifics as to her particular working group within the lab. But um, the larger argument I'm, I'm hoping to make, and that and we talked with Camilla about sort of when I were thinking about what we're going to present on, um, is that uh, uh, there is a sort of a social dimension, right, um, to, uh, to laboratories and how laboratories work. Um, and I don't know how many of you, I guess, have a laboratory at your home institution or have worked in a laboratory or have participated. Okay, so some but not all. And so I'm, I'm fairly new to UVA, Clement, and I came in the same year, but two years ago. Um, and laboratories are a thing here. They weren't a thing where I was before at UCLA. Um, and, um, and I have to say that um, laboratories are, for, for me at least, and I'm, I hope I speak for you, a, sort of a phenomenal sort of way of interacting across departments. Because departments create certain structures right, within universities. And laboratories, and centers also create certain structures within universities. But laboratories create other kinds of structures that kind of float. Um, and they're not entirely centers, right? And they're not departments, certainly. So um, what I want to talk about today is really um, not just the structure of the laboratory, and then Kim will talk about the specifics of one of the groups, um, but also the larger argument will be something like the social construction of knowledge or uh, social construction of how um, um, uh, knowledge communities work. Um, and we'll try to do this in seven minutes. Okay, so uh, really quickly then, um, there was uh, a comment that James made about cocktail parties uh, uh, of labs, right, um, and ways in which I think things get repeated. Um, and I want to take that but divorce it from its context. Um, the lab came up because Debjani at a cocktail party came up to me and said, hey, want to do a lab on informatics? And I was like, yeah, sure, right? And I had no idea what I was getting to. I had just gotten to UVA. We just like unpacked. And, um, and I didn't realize how much, you know, of my life was going to, I mean, and Debjani really has taken on most of the, the work of this lab, so I'm really grateful to her. But, um, but no, seriously, it was really through a cocktail conversation. Um, and um, and I, I feel like that's in, 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 in kind of like in a very miniature version, kind of the magic of the laboratory as a model. Um, so let me uh, just move forward a little bit. This um, 
the final pers uh, person or entity I should thank is SIF, which is the State Investment Fund, and that's who's funding this laboratory. Um, and this is sort of the verbiage from uh, the application that we gave to the state. And, and the other thing I was just surprised about was that the state was giving money to scholars to do something like this at all. Um, and so they, you know, invested. Oh, strategic investment fund. That's right. So strategic and not state. Sorry. Yeah, I was trying to remember because there was another SIF that floated around today, and I couldn't remember what. That, anyway, so, um, but I was just stunned that you know that the, that the state would invest money at all in this kind of project. Um, but again, you know, these kinds of things are only possible if you have a dean who's willing to sort of ha who has a vision um, and wants to sort of articulate a project, and an, and associate deans that you know support uh, the faculty. So, um, you know, I, th I think the laboratory, you know, we think of it as a standalone kind of structure, but in fact, it's nested within lots and lots of, sort of infrastructural kinds of entities, um, all of which have to function in certain ways for this to come about. Um, so, um, one of the major things that we wanted to do with the laboratory, um, you know, and looking around, and I was talking to Deb Johnny at this party, um, and, you know, we were thinking, oh, there are all these people who are working on information-based projects. And I use information in a very specific way. I know that, so, you know, Nicole's talking about data, and James is talking about knowledge, and I think those two are actually distinct from the kind of project that we're looking at with information. I, I think of information as separate, or, or at least it's related, but it's a separate kind of concept. Um, but thinking about sort of the people who are working on information here, and people that I didn't know work on information, like Matthew, you know, who in the music, um, musicology, whose amazing performance today, I didn't realize he was here and working on information-based projects. Um, so it was to kind of create a community, um, um, uh, to allow for a kind of conversation to take place. Um, and, um, and so this would cut across all sorts of disciplines, but it's humanities-centered, right? So the idea is that, you know, we in the humanities want to talk to people outside of the humanities. And in my own experience at other institutions, it's sometimes really hard to break into, say, digital humanities. You know, I've done some work in digital humanities, and, uh, and trying to get into those networks can be really daunting because you don't know who to talk to. You have a problem, you don't know how to solve it, right? So, um, so this was to create kind of this space for these kinds of conversations to take place. And information, informatics, for me, at least, when I think about it, it comes out of library science, the schools of information, um, and that's the kind of theories that I've been sort of reading and thinking about. Um, but also, of course, then engineering, mathematics, statistics, computer science, and neuroscience. Um, and then the aspect that I think that we wanted to bring to it as humanities scholars is not just the presentist model of what is information, what is it doing to our society, but the long historical scope of how societies have dealt with information, right, over time, over history. And the kind of problems that we face today are in some ways accelerations of the same kinds of problems that older societies faced and thought about and wrestled with. Um, the idea of too much to know was something that you hear repeated over and over again in Chinese documents in the Tang Dynasty, in the Jin Dynasty, in the Han Dynasty. And, you know, if they had more documents, I'm sure they would have said it in the Zhou Dynasty. But it is a problem that is a long-standing problem. Okay. Um, so, uh, the four working groups, and this is a descriptive part, um, and some of you are in the audience. Um, Human and Machine Intelligence is the group that I've spent the most time with, um, and um, Paul Humphreys in philosophy is there, uh, Vincente Ordonez Ramon in computer science, and, um, and this group has been... Uh, so, you know, the groups are, we have three years of funding, um, and the groups have finished their first year. The first year is really conversations, thinking about what are the scope of the problems that we want to engage with. The second year is the project, um, you know, what are, how are we going to spend this money now that we have it, right? And the last part of it is um, uh, some kind of outcome, and the outcomes differ depending on the group. Um, and I'm you know, happy to talk more about these things. Um, you know, I will say with, with um, Paul and Vincente's group, um, you know, we've been reading things like um, the question of universal intelligence, right? Is there a scale by which we can measure the idea of intelligence? Um, he's, uh, he and Vincente have brought in speakers from all across the, the, the departments here to talk about their views on what constitutes intelligence. Um, I'll have to say that I've never had these kinds of conversations before in my life. I've never been able to sort of be in a place where you can talk to, and the computer science people, I have to, I mean, I, I love the computer science people. Computer science people have no idea why we ask the questions that we ask in the humanities. They're constantly stunned that we would even pose these questions. The answer is often it works, right? And, you know, and it works is not the question that, that we're interested in. We're interested in questions like, but what is that, how are you defining this particular like concept, right? And, and for them, it's, they, that's a non -story. But, um, but the fact is, the computer science people come to these meetings again and again, right? We have a neuroscientist who comes to these meetings, even though he, I don't think he believes a word of, like, anything, you know, that we say from, from you know, their, their points. At the last 
talk by um, a wonderful graduate student in architecture, Zhao, so um, you know, went through um, the whole spate of theoretical concepts, and Chip was like, "That where's the math?" You know, I mean, it was, it was this kind of like, I, but he was there, right? And he was willing to engage. Um, network corpus, um, and this has um, been sort of a little bit in flux, but Rennie Map, who I saw earlier back there, yes, Rennie Map, um, and I didn't know how to tag you institutionally, so Office of the Vice President for Information Technology seemed to be where you are. Um, and uh, Brad Pasanek, who was here earlier today, I don't know if he's in English, um, and Chad Wellman in German. Um, and this has evolved a little bit um, from a kind of a DHG sort of group to something that's a little bit more pedagogically oriented. So one of the great things that Rennie has come up with is this idea of um, DH manuscript uh, reading groups, right? Where you have um, a young scholar who has a DH project, but you know, DH projects are hard to, to birth. They're, they take time, and you often don't get the kind of feedback that you need. And when you get the kind of feedback, you know, you don't, it may be too late. So you want to have the feedback come at an earlier point. And so the idea is, at least in one part of this, is to have a scholar from outside or a scholar from here give constructive feedback, have a seminar around a DH manuscript so that that scholar can then sort of go forth and, and produce that work. Um, other things, the DH initiative here at UVA, um, you know, we are thrilled to be able to help support that, um, um, and the DH certificate. Um, so there are pedagogical outcomes that we're hoping to see. Um, we're hoping to have classes that come out of some of these um, you know, as well. Um, Brad has his own sort of si side project in this called Puzzle Poetry. Um, if Brad were here, I'd have him explain it to you, but it involves poetry and polyominoes, um, which are more than dominoes. Um, and, in, and Chad has, you know, as long standing, he'll talk tomorrow, but he's had a long standing interest in um, the university as a site of information. Um, smart environments, Mona El Khafif was here, is here. Yes, hi Mona, and, um, and Gina Ripple, um, School of Architecture. Um, I had the pleasure of dining with them last night and hearing about their plans. Um, and, uh, and, and Mona and Gina are, are looking. So, I mean, smart environments, thinking about, um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mischaracterize your work, I'm so sorry. But um, th there are more on the practical side of the lab, um, not the theoretical side, but thinking about um, how things like buildings adapt to the environment around them, right? Um, so, um, and, and I think about this as extending beyond buildings to things like traffic lights. How do traffic lights sort of understand when it's best to be optimizing, when it's best to be red, when it's best to be green, um, allowing for efficient, uh, um, efficient flows of, of traffic? Surveillance infrastructure, Camilla is going to talk about in a moment um, um, with her colleague uh, Elizabeth Elsesser in Media Studies. And I think this is the point at which I turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay? No? Okay. Can, can you hear me now? How about now? Yeah. Much better. Okay. So the Surveillance and Infrastructure Lab um, explores various kinds of things around surveillance. And actually, I want to skip this slide and go to the other slide where I think um, I can connect up a little bit more to something that James was saying about abduction. So what we're doing in the lab, when Jack and I were talking about what we would talk about for this, um, I thought I would talk about what is a lab? Why are we using the scientific idea of a lab to think about these, these topics? And in a sense, what a lab does is it abducts an object from its sort of natural environment and brings it into a new context. And so in surveillance and infrastructure, what we wanted to do is take surveillance studies and take the apparatus of surveillance and bring it into a new context. Um, address surveillance through new different ki or different kinds of questions. And we have uh, brought in a number of speakers to talk about surveillance and to think through um, ideas about surveillance. And one common sort of theme that has come up is a theme that I think um, is not about outcomes of labs, which tend to be about the consolidation of knowledge, the production of knowledge, but one theme that's come out of it is failure and the failure of surveillance. So, um, for example, we talked about with Shoshana Magnet, who came in to speak to us, the failures of biometric data capture. We talked with, for example, Joshua Reeves about the failures of the security state to fully deputize citizens in a sort of don't, uh, I was gonna say don't ask, don't tell, see something, <laughs> say something kind of um, surveillance apparatus. Uh, and 
Um, recently, I was telling Jack I was at what, I would, what I'm calling surveillance camp <laughs> at Skidmore, and it was a documentary program of artists, intellectuals, activists who came together to really think through surveillance through, through mediation, through media. And one of the films, um, it, it's currently sort of making the rounds in, in um, the uh, um, film festival circuit, is called The Feeling of Being Watched. If anyone's heard of this, I'm not sure. And it's about the surveillance of Arab American communities in a suburb of Chicago. And so for years and years, the FBI was surveilling this community and trying to uh, capture people doing something suspicious. And they never did. And for years and years and years, um, all of this money was being funneled to this project. And they would do things like um, try to figure out what was going on with economic practices that are cultural. So the filmmaker whose father died um, was the, the community had come together and um, collected all this money, $200,000, for that family to purchase their home outright. And this was considered suspicious, a suspicious way of collecting money together. And then it was put under suspicion. So all of these kinds of practices that might be cultural, which are kind of um, alien or, or um, considered suspicious to a certain kind of gaze, then become part of this this file, this intense file of, um, on this community. And so the film is about rethinking this, rethinking how the surveillance worked. Um, they, um, the filmmaker asked under FOIA for all of the files that were produced about this case and then made art out of that and asked the community to come in and to, to look at these files and recognize themselves in this kind of security apparatus. So um, that, that film is, in a sense, about failure. And so one of the things that we were thinking about is not only how to abduct um, and take the object of surveillance studies and put it in a new context, but also how to take that um, new context and put it somewhere else, to, to take it out of the lab. So for example, um, there are the number of political implications of data management for marginal communities for whom um, the collection of data means maybe not being able to get a job, not being able to um, seek housing, get loans, those kinds of things. Um, how do you um, think about how that data can be remanaged, um, recaptured? Or um, so, for example, there's an activist uh, scholarly community called Our Data Bodies that actively organizes um, communities and advocates and teaches about human rights and data justice. And so the idea is to, to bring some of these things together, to, to cast a new gaze on surveillance studies, and then think about ways that we can bring it out of the context of, of a lab and the production of expertise and the production of knowledge. So um, one way of thinking about that in terms of this um, our data bodies is that the, their idea is how, how do you foil data capture? How do you make the system fail? Um, so again, it falls in line with this whole idea of the production of failure. So the overall goal of the surveillance um, lab then is to kind of, is to create knowledge. It's to do something that labs do, which is produce knowledge, produce new ways of, of, of I'll just hold this, of, <laughs> <laughs> of looking at Sorry. a <laughs> It's interactive, it, we're working together. He's a plant. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so we do want to produce new knowledges, but we also want to um, do this within the context of the university. So how do we create new courses, um, bring this kind of um, information and research into other areas of the university or into things like coursework, thinking through um, the way that we already teach in adding surveillance studies or the study of infrastructure into um, courses around the university. So uh, Jack has a few closing remarks about this, and um, I'll let him finish that up, and then we'll, we can take questions during the question and answer period. And I will turn this off. <laughs> yeah, so my, my wife often, you know, she's also in the field, um, and she'll be at a, some conference having a serious conversation with someone, and I'll be hooting out in the hallway, and she'll be like, I can hear you. <laughs> um, so the uh, last bit, um, I want to bring this back, I think, to a larger sort of context. Um, 
community has extended minds. So uh, there are just two quotations I, I was thinking about. One from Anthony, Andy Clark and David Chalmers. You know, they wrote the uh, essay that was fairly um, um, influential called The Extended Mind. Um, and so uh, I won't read through the whole thing, but you understand the idea of sort of a distributed intelligence or distributed cognition, the mind extending beyond the, the body, um, or at least the brain. And then Norbert Wiener, who, um, uh, whom Lydia Leo has talked about uh, today, um, has come up a couple times. But um, uh, this, qu this quotation I thought was, was useful because it brings us back to the issue of cybernetics, right? And cybernetics, I feel like, has been one of the um, uh, and of course it makes sense for it to be kind of a recurring theme in the informatics lab, um, given that cybernetics and information um, are sort of co-birthed. But, um, but the idea, again, of the content of what's exchanged with the outer world is we adjust to it, right? make our adjustment felt upon it. Um, so I was thinking about you know, a cybernetic system as one that involves right, control, communication, feedback loops, right? that feedback into um, um, a system or an organism. Um, and Norbert Wiener was interested in cybernetics in relation to both machines and animals, right? He thought that there was some kind of way in which we can think about these two on, on some same level. Um, and I want to turn from that to a different sort of depiction of the cybernetic model, which is from N. Catherine Hales, which I don't have a quote for. But she says that there are three phases, right, in, in cybernetic history. Um, and the first one, she doesn't name it, but this is the first cybernetic model, which is, has to do with um, the idea of homeostasis, um, the idea that an organism wants to sort of be in equilibrium with its environment and therefore makes adjustments as it gets information coming from outside the environment. Uh, the second model, then she says, is one of reflexivity. And reflexivity is the organism, or, or the organism not just taking in feedback from the environment, but the organism seeing itself as part of that system. And that sort of acknowledgement of the organism as part of the system, creating this other sort of layer of feedback. So the organism is no longer this kind of like positive thing that takes in information, but is observing itself, right? And observing itself is another form of information, another information that, that's coming to the organism. The third model that she says is virtuality. Um, and this is a conversation that Mona and I were having last night about the Internet of Things, right? And so if we move from, you know, um, the organism as isolated, receiving information from the environment, which is not unlike the extended mind model that Clark and Chalmers are talking about, um, if you take it from a different perspective, right? I mean, they're seeing the mind as extending through things. And I feel like this was a conversation that I could hear echoes of with Ashil Mbembe's um, keynote speech um, the other night when he's talking about animism, right? The idea that, um, you know, we have this, um, we exist with tools, um, we exist in relationships with the world, um, but we impose um, our mind on it and, and we, um, and, and it, with an animistic model, of course, these things may have um, co-equal weight. They're not necessarily the human at the center of things, but this may bring us to a possible post-human moment. And so in some ways, I think you know, what, what I heard from Ashil was this idea of a pre-post-humanism. Uh, um, and the critique I would have of the Clark and Chalmers model is that it centers so much on the human, and the human as prosthetic, the human as extending itself into the world. Um, and the third model that and Catherine Hales talks about of the Internet of Things, she doesn't say it that way, she talks about virtuality, but as sort of a world in which everything is plugged in and wired and therefore everything is connected on this other level, the virtual level. I would think that another way of thinking about that third wave of cybernetics is complexity. Thinking about how we are a lab that's abducted from one context, put in another, right? But that that abduction um, allows that lab to be part of larger conversations, larger communities. Um, and in that second year, we're looking at projects that will go out, right, and, and sort of spread the seed of whatever these sort of conversations were in that first year. And in the third year, those conversations will then become the, the, the basis, the foundation, for a larger conversation that involves people from outside of the university, right, from other centers, other laboratories. And, um, and I think about, you know, the way in which the community has extended mind, how it might be which is that you know, it's not the human at the center of this or one human mind at the center of these conversations, but rather a distribution of minds, you know, all of which are co-equal, um, and out of which I think um, we, we get some sense of, um, uh, I think, productive form of knowledge. Thank you. Hello. 
Hello, Andres Claro from Universidad de Chile. Um, thank you very much for these three very illuminating uh, interventions. Uh, my question is from James Evans. Uh, I was very interested by this idea of collective side of thinking, collective reason, how uh, our ways of thinking socialized. And one could think that it all depends on certain shared imaginative habits, uh, on figurative habits that define the ways we conceptualize, the conditions of possibility under which we conceptualize, but also the conditions of possibility under which we create certain topologies from the geometrical that you were emphasizing there to the metaphysical, topologies in which we would certainly find certain isomorphisms that are defined by these ways of thinking. Just an example, one can give a comparison between the ways of parallelism habits in the Chinese tradition and analogy habit in the Western tradition. So it defines a way of conceptualizing in the Chinese tradition to say universe, you would say heaven, earth, parallelism, but it also, and in the West you would say cosmos, so order, a metaphor. Uh, the same, uh, metaphysical topology, the Tao. The Tao, you, pro you project the parallelism tropology into a metaphysical topology, which is correlative, parallelism again, whereas Platonic ontology projects the tropology of metaphor into uh, a metaphysical topology. And he's, this is the question then. Uh, sorry about this long Great introduction, setup. but I think it was necessary. <laughs> uh, the, the question would be, uh, what would be uh, the link that algorithm impose on impressions? So is algorithm just a synonym for a function? Just for so analogy and whatever parallelism will be just algorithms, uh, short algorithms, or is algorithm uh, a function that has its own specificity, its own specificity of way of linking? And if that is the case, what would be the kind of conceptualization that uh, algorithm produces, and what is the kind of topology that algorithm produces? Thank you. Um, uh, here is this, is this on? Is this kind of on? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, I I, th I think. Um, I'm going to take your setup and not exactly your question, I, I, you know, uh, because I, I think the setup is, is so interesting in the sense that I would say, you know, modern uh, machine learning autoencoders, and that's a that's that's like a big, uh, you know, sounds like a messy phrase, but it's these efforts to basically kind of take language, take other kinds of objects, and understand, which is to say, fit their collective underlying geometry. Right, and then it turns out that when you do that, uh, I would say, you know, probably since 2013, you know, so for the last five years, so when you do that, um, a lot of metaphors actually pop out, right? And so, uh, so you can do these kind of vector oper operations, which you know are on this very discrete system that you've learned from a bunch of literature, and you can discover many of these, precisely these kinds of associations. And of course, there are different ways to do it. The data doesn't just speak. You know, if you impose a hyperbolic geometry, you get, you get hierarchy. If you impose a Euclidean geometry, you get dimensions. You know, you get different kinds of things with different, uh, so I just to, I would say to the, to the broader uh, point I is at some level, that project of discovering, you know, the patterns of uh, and kind of collective facility at thinking in certain ways, at making certain extensions. I think w one of the powers of, of uh, you know, these methods are to, to encapsulate that. Uh, right? And then you can do one of two things. You can kind of, you know, reproduce a culture, if you will, and you can do the opposite, right? You can actually, you know, think about them as the most surprising uh, of each other. And I, I think it's not obvious to me, to your real question, uh, what's the right way to think about, you know, what is algorithm in this context. I mean, I would say because they're so regular and because you can discover that regularity, I'm not bothered by talking about uh, the human and cultural systems as algorithmic in that sense, insofar as they, they look sufficiently rule-based that we can, by applying seemingly uh, um, uh, nuanced rules that we can actually reproduce some of those things. So I'm not offended by that. Uh, and yet it's not obvious that we get a lot of purchase from it. Thank you. I, I thought the talks were all charming, and I and I used that word actually advisedly, and they were <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and and um, I th all right because there you were talking about modeling and algorithms, and but they were punctuated all of them with um, illustrative stories or case studies that 
exposed what exposed what was at stake in the questions. And that observation led me to wonder about the, I mean, and you all did draw attention to the importance of storytelling, that there's a story that exposes what's at stake in the analysis. But that led me to wonder about the importance of the embodiedness of the storyteller um, in this kind of work. Um, and which felt like the difference between reading an analysis and listening to one at a conference. So I, I wondered if you could reflect upon how the stories in the analyses make us care. And, um, and just the, the final observation is that I left these papers with the most urgent question um, being the most irrelevant, and that is, Nicole, how's your brother? Oh. <laughs> 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 um, well, I, yeah, yeah, my, bro <laughs> my brother um, is, is doing well. But uh, in fact, he sat in the emergency room for two hours, and when the cardiologist came in, she said, get this man immediately um, into surgery. And he had a heart attack mm -hmm. on the table while they were just prepping him. But he's fine now. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the most important. Uh, <laughs> that was charming. Did you, you, did you, yeah. <laughs> you want? Did you want me to take that? Yeah. 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 Well, um, I mean, I, I, I um, would certainly say that it's um, um, utterly essential, and and I say that in the context of you know. Being at Stanford in the midst of Silicon Valley, where there is so much um, of a, you know, if it's if if it there isn't the kind of embrace of the notion of the singularity, there is certainly um, a comfortable space with um, the equating of the brain, you know, the m mind and machine, um, and you know, the work that we are doing is really precisely to put the machine at the service of the mind in a space where reflection, contemplation, the opportunity for intuition to, you know, to come about is made possible. So, um, so that kind of, you know, human processing is something that gets to happen. But, um, but the relationship of, of human and, and particularly mind to machine is, um, is a, an externalizing actually, like it's an external process that draws out more. Uh, at least that's what we found in, in the lab. Um, and it was absolutely fascinating. And, I mean, I can give you um, an example where I was, in fact, working with, um, with the literary lab group. Uncle Murray was out of town. And um, uh, there was a discussion there about different types of reading. And the conversation just became immediately tense, very, very tense, with that, you know, discussing distant reading and close reading and surface reading. And um, th there, nobody was getting around and said, okay, wait, stop for a moment, and let's all draw these different kinds of reading and think in terms of, you know, pick some object, and they picked a, 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 an orange, right, and then broke up into groups of two and drew this kind of reading of an orange. And it was fascinating, not only because um, the, you know, what they came up with, but the fact that of two individual partners working on a drawing, they had completely different interpretations of what they had just drawn. But it changed the whole mood from um, a conflict to just uh, people were laughing and, and enjoying and having a lot of time. Um, by uh, externalizing these ideas, um, you know, visually. But the visual part of it was, in fact, kind of secondary. I think it was just the experience of working together on a project like that. Can I really quickly, just um, instead of um, embodied, I was going to use the word framework. So I think the different frameworks where we can understand what we're doing, right? And this is a, a, a conversation I was having with Gina Ripple from School of Architecture last night, the same dinner that Mona hosted. Um, so Andy Clark and David Chalmers has this, they have make this analogy in the essay. They say that um, fish are really good at swimming, right? Um, they're really good at reading the eddies and the energy of water as they move through it. And then they say that, um, and the fish and the ripples and the 
eddies and the whirls create this perfect swimming machine. Um, and I think that's so wrong. I mean, that's so ichthyocentric, right? I mean, you know, it's from the perspective of the ocean, it's not swimming, right? The ocean isn't swimming. And I think that's the problem when we, you know, have these embod and that's what my framework, that I'd say that's the problem. Can I just, I'm sorry, one, just one tiny thing. I mean, I think at some level, this is, I mean, this is the potential. This is the potential to take seriously the diversity of the storyteller and the diversity of the audience, right? Uh, and I think, uh, I, I think you know, selecting our machines, uh, generating, creating our machines in ways that they facilitate the kind of experience as audience, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the kind of generativity uh, as 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 speaker is is precisely, I mean, taking that seriously, I think is 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 what we're about. Right, in some sense, you know, and, and if we don't take that, if we take that unthinkingly, then I think we've lost the, the whole space of opportunity that we're, that we're trying to, to carve out here. You know. Also, I think, um, I think we began with the body, with the uh, abduction, and that started, uh, uh, I'm sure for everybody, a lot of ideas uh, about not just that the robots are upon us, but um, abductions of other kinds, especially when we have undocumented migrants in cages or abductions uh, that have to do with undue process or lack of due process. And that's everything, I mean, surveillance studies is all about that. And so that, that's sort of why I began with the notion of uh, our data bodies as a place to think through the kind of political implications of thinking about surveillance. And abduction is sort of the perfect <laughs> way of, of maybe linking all of these ideas together. So my question is mainly for Nicole, but if anybody else wants to chime in, that would be great. Um, I love the idea that data is rhetorical. But um, if that's true, then how can it be confused with argument since argument is fundamentally rhetorical? <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's, but it's, it's the expression, I guess, is what I would say, of, of the data um, that's important and the, and the expression of the data in, in the context that I'm talking about is precisely embodied. Um, and so it, it, it comes um, with a particular context. So I guess I see, I, I read an, um, the, the notion of data as rhetorical, as I said, as um, a, a, a making it you know, more potential and, and giving us the opportunity to, um, to contextualize it depending on what the particular kind of disciplinary conversation is. Um, and so um, confusing it with argument um, in that context, what I meant was when the data is taken as is, the data itself is the argument without the, the surrounding context. Um, but thank you for pointing that out. I should, uh, I should tease that out and clarify that. Also, just Rosenberg's, um, you know, he's looking at this from three different perspectives, right? Epistemological, ontological, and rhetorical. So data is, is like the affordance. It's, it's the same thing, object. The object can be evidence, it can be fact, it can be data, and it's being leveraged as, as data when it's being used in argument. I think that's, if I remember. Um, it wouldn't be leveraged as uh, evidence in an argument? Um, no, it's trying to persuade. So I if you look at it from the perspective of, of knowing, then it's evidence. If it's part of the construction of the argument, then it's rhetorical. I, I think, I mean. Uh, well, okay. so I, I guess that's specialized language because, of course, in a court of law, evidence is precisely marshaled to persuade. Um, but I, I mean, I think those distinctions are, are interesting, and I'm very grateful that you brought them to my attention. Hi, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, so so uh, I, I found a resonance between uh, what, what James was, um, uh, when, you, when you were showing the algorithm of, of citations, one of the points you made is that the, the in, in terms of the sciences, because they have these um, mass authored, if you think thousand plus authors for something, um, and then the, the, the predictability 
the, the degree of predictability is high. It's, it's about, about th they have less capacity to surprise us. So in that sense, if, if the lab is an epistemic experiment for the humanities, not for the sciences, because this, this is meant to be a workshop where we are actually discussing a different format of work, right? Uh, and the, but the lab then, in Jack's language, is a community of scholars and a, and a collective intelligence that has as its horizon uh, a generation of, of a capacity to surprise us, to produce the singular in a way. That's the aspiration. And, and, uh, and so, so it, I'd, I'd be very interested in, in hearing about this, this kind of tension. I, I always knew that the citations were overrated. I know that in the, <laughs> in the whole system <laughs> and how it works against us humanists. Uh, um, but I'd, I'd, be, I'd be very, in I, I found that deeply fascinating, uh, all the talks. I just wondered if you had any insights into, really is it worth, worth us collecting our intelligence together, doing this work together, or what are the prospects? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it, it's, it, it is interesting because at some level, you know, why do we gather, for example, in a lab, right, to facilitate community, it, uh, to pull together and advocate for funds, to, I mean, this is, you know, uh, I remember um, chatting with, um, a bioscientist who was who basically was behind the the sequencing of the first plant genome in the late 1990s, and his his you know he brought together a conference you know with 35 people, and his entire purpose was to get them to all agree uh, in on a one sentence claim, which is that we believe with X amount of funds that we can uh, functionally annotate every gene in the Arabidopsis genome. That's, that's, that, that was the one thing he wanted, because he knew that if they could agree, that group of 35 people could agree on that sentence, they could get those funds. Uh, and so um, I would say, um, you know, one of the great challenges is that I see in many other contexts, including in our study of social sciences and humanities groups, sir, that the, the largest groups, the largest labs are almost always inherently the most conservative. Um, and so, so at some level, you know, uh, there's an effort to kind of like build a group so we can do something completely different. And yet there is this tension that whenever, not whenever, but almost whenever we build such a group uh, and, you know, the stakes get higher because we've got strategic investment, uh, then it's very difficult to do anything that wasn't expected and or to follow our nose, right, or to follow or to break the mandate, which becomes something that kind of hangs over us. I mean, in fact, we, we did one study where we looked at people who were funded at various levels, and it turned out, for example, that, um, that the people who didn't get funding from the NIH and the NSF, uh, who stayed in the system, ended up doing better or more surprising work over time. So I think, I, I, so I, I think it's, it's good to be afraid, uh, to be afraid of, of, you know, like the kind of the, the, the chains that come with uh, resources and opportunity to be, uh, Careful, and to, to think about creating structures that facilitate maybe core resource, you know, core resources that allow individuated uh, responses, and and not just you know kind of uh, happy cocktails, but but kind of warring uh, bands of you know 